Well, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, and, and thanks for having me here today and paying for my lunch. That was a great treat. I'll be back next Friday. Um, <laughs> I, I've really been looking forward to this opportunity to talk to you about our work. Um, though I've been a little bit nervous, I will say, because now it's going to get out that I get paid to play with bubbles. Um, so don't tell too many people, or it might get taken away from me. Uh, but we're going to see that we're going to actually play with some bubbles here in a few minutes, and we're going to try to connect that to some of the research concepts we use in the lab to mimic how cells talk to one another. Okay, and uh, on the weekends, I like to play bubbles with my three-year-old son, and he's really good at it, and he thinks he's just playing, but it's really career training. Uh, he just doesn't know it yet, okay? <laughs> so you were probably thinking about cellular gossip, and I hope you didn't come for this type of talk. Um, <laughs> but uh, I like these pictures. So, we're, so what is cell communication? Um, you probably have an intuitive sense of this, but it's the process by which a cell, right, the structures that make up plants and animals, uh, it's how they communicate, it's how they detect signals, it's how they respond to cues in the environment. Uh, and in the body, there are kind of three main classes of cell communication, right? And I kind of think of them in terms of how far-reaching or short-reaching those uh, signal transduction processes are. So the juxtacrine or direct contact is one way that cells communicate. And you can think of two cells kind of holding hands with one another. And so they can pass information, they can pass chemical cues through that kind of direct contact. Uh, a little bit farther away, but maybe not too far, illustrated by the tin can phone, would be the paracrine or autocrine uh, ways to communicate information via chemical transport. And so cells will secrete information, secrete chemicals, they will diffuse around the cell, and neighboring cells will pick up those chemicals and then understand something to do with it, right? And our long-distance dis long phone call version is the endocrine uh, method of transport. And for the most part, this is where cells secrete information, secrete chemicals into the bloodstream, and then that gets carried throughout the body, okay? And so all of these processes are very, very key to maintaining a healthy organism and a living plant or animal. So let's look at a couple examples. So gap junctions, uh, you may not think about gap junctions a lot, but gap junctions are a type of uh, juxtacrine, that handshake type of communication between cells. And they occur in electrical neurons in the brain, but they also are key in muscle cells in your heart. And so these joining of neighboring muscle cells in the heart via gap junction channels allows them to all beat together, right? And so if they didn't have that quick connection, that handshake that maintains that information passage, they wouldn't be able to synchronize their activity and our hearts probably wouldn't work very well. Maybe the classic example of a, of a paracrine, kind of a short uh, distance signal processing event in living systems is the release of neurotransmitters. Right? And, and there are many types of examples, um, acetylcholine, glutamate, dopamine, serotonin, chemicals that affect how we think, how our muscles behave, whether we're paralyzed or not. Um, all these types of information uh, get passed between neurons at very small junctions, like the one shown here in the blue image, called a synapse, and it's releasing packets of chemical information and, and then that gets picked up by the neighboring cell. So that's an important one. Uh, a good example of an endocrine style transport or cell communication, cellular gossip, would be the release of hormones into the bloodstream that get picked up at other tissues in the body. Right? Insulin is a really good example. Um, and so the hormone insulin comes in and this GIF shows kind of the, the response that a receptor bound on the surface of a cell can pick up that insulin that it sees in the bloodstream and know that it needs to process glucose in a certain way to maintain uh, enough energy for the cell itself to make, to make new species, but also to keep the blood sugar in the blood in check. So just to recap, we've got multiple types of transport and we've got multiple distances and, and as a result, time frames over which these transport events occur, okay? So these are kind of the classical examples of transport in the body cellular gossip. And I think you could imagine that if we understand these well, and that's what we try to do as researchers, 
then it could have a lot of important implications, right? We could maybe better understand diseases or treating health disorders. We could maybe develop better treatments, drugs that target specific receptors on cells that help cells communicate better um, so that they operate uh, properly. We could potentially engineer tissues that aid in this process, right? We could maybe even provide wearable sensing technologies that could monitor our health in real time and give us a better understanding of our physical state and keep track of specific biomarkers. Um, and an example of that is for diabetics, being able to keep track of your blood glucose, it's very important. Uh, but there's maybe more information that's in the body that, that we would benefit from monitoring. I'll talk a little bit more about these in the coming slides, but I'm gonna propose that by understanding these types of cellular communication events or cellular gossip, we could understand the effects of nanomaterials that people are developing, and I will say that in many cases, we don't yet know what they do to the body. So it would be really important to know how these things interact with the body and the environment. And I'll pose a question here. Could we even design better or more powerful computing technologies that are based on soft materials and based on the same principles that the brain uses in our bodies, okay? So let's zoom into a single cell, and this is the classical uh, type of picture you would, you would find on Wikipedia, which is where I found mine, uh, of a mammalian cell. And I never took a biology class, I'll be fully transparent, but what I know about a cell is that it's a very complex structure and it's encapsulated in a cell membrane and it's subdivided by cell membranes, okay? So it's a unit by itself, but within it, it has other compartments and how they all interact and operate independently and together enables the cell to function, right? These membranes, these interfaces, are built from lipids. And you've probably heard that term. A lot of foods that we eat are built from lipids. Um, but membranes are built from mainly lipids. Um, and a key property about lipids, as this kind of chemical structure tries to denote, is that they are amphiphilic. Has anybody heard that term? Another word, of, another word for that same meaning is amphiphatic or amphiphatic, amphipathic, I can't even say it. But what it means is that the molecule has both a hydrophilic region, meaning it likes to be around water, and a hydrophobic region, meaning it doesn't like to be around water, right? So it's kind of this dual nature that these molecules, which make up cell membranes, have. And we'll see that it, that property uh, enables the membranes to act as we need them to, and it's something that we leverage in the laboratory to be able to assemble mimics of cell membranes, okay? So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about over the next few minutes is our attempt in the laboratory to mimic the structure of a cell membrane so that we can study some of these questions that we're interested in. And the reason we don't do it in the cell is the cell has a lot of stuff going on and we wanna have kind of a simple reductionist way to study just a few things at a, at a given time. So it, it affords some simplicity, and a question that we have to keep in mind is, are we being too simple at, at some points? Are we losing information by reducing the system? Okay, so maybe this is what you came for, soap bubbles. So how does this all relate to soap bubbles, okay? So I'll start by just describing the molecule we see on this slide, and then we'll do some demonstrations, okay? So the soap molecule looks quite similar to the lipid molecule, and I should have pointed it out, um, on this slide that these two, we call them uh, acyl chains or fatty acid tails. They are the hydrophobic part, they don't like to be around water, and this kind of head-like unit is the hydrophilic part that likes to be around water, right? So a soap molecule usually just has one leg or one tail, but it has that same division of not liking to be around water and liking to be around water, so quite similar. And it's about the same size, about two nanometers in size, okay? so. That property enables cells, and, or enables uh, bubbles to form. This is what I was doing last night. Need a little bit more. There we go. Ah, 
stage fright, right? But what I'm trying to do is create bubbles and link them together. Too jittery. Right? So you've all seen this a million times, right? Bubbles stick together, right? But it's kind of pretty. It's pretty interesting how perfect their geometry is when they come together, how they have these kind of dynamic uh, shapes, but they, ad they adhere well. They're, they're very fluid. They're translucent, but there's still some color at times, right? So we can connect these things. You promised me in my kitchen last night I could connect them really well. So we can form connections almost like a caterpillar that's just a bubble, okay? And so that property, the fact that it has a hydrophilic part and a hydrophobic part, is key to why this can work, okay? So you might not have thought about a bubble too much, but it's just, it's a volume of air, and the little skin that makes up the bubble is a thin film of water, and then stabilizing both of those interfaces are these soap molecules. And so those soap molecules, the hydrophilic head points to the water, and the tails point out to air, where they're happy, okay? So that helps minimize the energy of the system, and that's why we don't have square bubbles, we have circular bubbles, because that's also a minimal energy state for the system. They like to be curved, smooth, and round, okay? So, let's see if this one works a little better. And I may need a, a volunteer for this. So I'm gonna try to drag up a sheet Oh, no. What's the definition of soap? Hmm. I think the definition of soap is just a surfactant. It's any molecule that likes to interact on a surface, right? So, so surfactant is a word. It's actually a joining of words. Surface active agent is the word surfactant. So it's anything that wants to join together, right? So what I have here is some straws and some string, and in between there you may be able to see a thin soap film that's spanning vertically there, right? That soap film is actually causing the strings to curve too, right? So that gives us some kind of visible proof that there's a force exerted by the film. And we'll see how that comes into play here in a minute, right? Mm -hmm. Raise it into the light. Raise it into the light? Oh, very good idea. Can you see any of the colors? Oh. oh. Now we get the Schlieren effect of seeing the different densities of fluids move in that film. That's pretty cool. That's better than I anticipated. Wow. I think I owe this guy some money. <laughs> All right, so that's our film, right? So what would happen if we stuck our finger through it? Right. Yep. But what if you wet your finger first? Would you like to wet your finger and stick it through there? You might need soap on it rather than just your saliva. <laughs> I'm going to have to make my film again. Whichever. Ah, so it did pop, yep. So maybe your finger wasn't wet enough. But if you had something that was wet enough, you should be able to pass your finger all the way through that, you right? The straw. Right, you could wet the straw, take one of those straws and pass it through there. Are, you are great helpers. We should start a magic routine. So there's, I don't know if you can see that, there's a good image of the fluid. You can see the fluids moving around in that thin film, right? 
So that's pretty thin. I mean, it's something we've seen a million times, right? But do you ever stop to really think it? Maybe I'm the only one that does that, right? So that's our little demo on bubbles, right? And maybe, hopefully I illustrated that they're dynamic. I think they're really pretty. Um, they're quite soapy. And it's all made possible by the fact that these molecules have this water liking part or water uh, loving part and a water hating part, right? And you might have seen some colors in there. And this, in case there was a question, those colors tell you something about thickness. So as light goes through that thin film, it gets reflected um, at different amounts. And that all depends on the thickness. And so the colors we see are just different regions of thickness in the bubble. So going back to this picture, you see those swirling colors around there. Those are different thicknesses of water of that little bubble structure. Right. And they often change, like when I blow bubbles at home, you know, they might start out kind of pink and like this, and then they become bluer, and then they pop. Right? So it's thinning, 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 and then it pops. I don't know if this will work, but we'll play it. This is one more demo. This is something I found online. This is demonstrating that the fluid, the, the soap film is very, very fluid, right? And so it responds to any perturbation, even if it's acoustic. And so you can make your soap film dance to your favorite soundtrack, right? <laughs> And again, I like the kind of fact that it stirs up the colors based on the different inputs there, right? So it's a very dynamic structure, OK? All right, so, so that hopefully gets me well to my similarity slide. So we're, we're now going to start talking about better mimics of cell membranes. But I will argue that the soap films we just looked at are pretty good models of the cellular encapsulation around all of our cells, which is amazing. OK, so we saw that in the soap films, we had a little bit of water and soap legs pointing out. And in a cell membrane, it's kind of the opposite case. right? We have water inside the cell and water outside the cell in our bodies. And those legs, those hydrophobic regions, point in. But they're both bilayers. Right? So they're both two layers of amphiphiles or surfactant molecules that make up that sheet. They create fluid barriers. So just as you saw the fluid moving around and the colors kind of diffusing dynamically, the molecules in a cell membrane can move laterally all around. So I wouldn't think of it as a solid. I'd really consider you to think of it or encourage you to think of it as a liquid. It's a fluid interface that surrounds all of our living cells. Right? Now there are additionally are extracellular matrices that help support and give structure to cells. But that cell membrane is a fluid structure. All right, and it's semi-permeable or selectively permeable. That means it has some preference for what can go through it and what couldn't. And her demonstration where she was able to dip the straw and pass it through maybe hopefully illustrated that point, right? For the soap film, if the structure was sufficiently wet, then it was allowed to pass through and it kept the film stable. And if it didn't like it, when her finger was maybe a little too dry or her fingernail was a little rough, then that popped the structure and it dis destabilized the whole thing. So it turns out that cell membranes behave exactly the same way. So since the inner portion of them is a little bit more water hating than small molecules um, and hydrophobic species oils can pass through a cell membrane, uh, whereas large molecules like glucose or large ions cannot. And so they need other ways to get through. And that's where ion channels and transporters that exist, proteins that exist in cell membranes, that's where they act as the gatekeepers for these other things to get through. Okay. So hopefully that analogy kind of makes sense. Okay. Go for it. Restructure water, but you can do that later. Okay. The okay. Japanese are talking about about restructured water. Yeah, the negative oxygen reduction potential breaking up the molecules somehow. Oh wow. High hydrogen water is supposed to go into the cells really good. Okay. I, I don't know anything about that, so we'll, talk we'll talk offline. I'm looking for somebody to talk about this. Right? Okay. <laughs> I'll be your guy. So this is our analogy to the soap bubble, OK? And I skipped the last slide because I don't think we need it. But this is how we mimic a cell membrane in the lab. And it's something really simple, OK? We take water droplets and put them in oil. And we put those lipids that have regions that like to be around water and regions that don't like to be around water. We either dissolve those in the oil, and they're really small, we can't see them, or we put them in the water, and they self-assemble at the surface of the droplets. So they form a shell, a single layer. We'd call it in 
uh, technical terms, we'd say it forms a monolayer around each droplet. And when we bring them into contact, they don't coalesce into one big droplet like you might imagine, but instead they form a stable connection somewhat similar to how those bubbles would connect and form planar interfaces in my kind of cheap demonstration a couple minutes ago, right? They can form that adhesive contact. And so it's this interface, as my cartoon up in the top right tries to demonstrate, it's that interface that is a mimic of the structure and composition of a cell membrane, okay? So it's a really simple way to experimentally mimic that embodiment, that environment. And so we will make use of this in some different research projects where we try to understand transport and signaling across cellular membranes. And in the community, this is known as the droplet interface bilayer. Sense of scale, these are not true to scale. These droplets are maybe a millimeter in size. So a couple hundred nanoliters of volume, um, very, very small volumes, and we're looking at them through an objective of, of a microscope. So they're small, but they're not terribly small. But the interface, that thin film that forms there, is only two molecules thick. So it's only about five nanometers thick, okay? So how big is a nanometer? Your hair, not mine, but yours, your hair is about 80,000 nanometers in diameter. So while we can see that the droplets are connected, right, we're not actually seeing the interface because that's too small to see. We're just seeing kind of the reflection and the refractive difference of the oil and the water. So we'll talk about how we characterize those, right? So one way to do it, and this shows maybe a couple points, is that we can simply, excuse me, put wire type electrodes in each droplet, impale them, and that allows us to make electrical measurements and gain information about things that are too small to see, okay? But it also allows us to move them around. And so what this little video shows, and this was taken a long time ago, um, it shows two droplets that were connected together to form this droplet interface bilayer, and I'm pulling one electrode, and it's dragging the droplet with it. And what you may notice is, is that there's a true adhesion between them until they kind of pop apart, all right? So that's very qualitative, but it gives you a sense that there was a connection there. It was, they weren't just close together. They were, they were fully formed, okay? So we can do a lot of different things by having the electrodes in there, and I'll, I'll go to some of that in, in the coming slides. Um, but one of the types of things we can measure are the opening and closing of ion channels, okay? So ion channels are very prevalent molecules that exist in cell membranes, and they open and close to allow other things to pass. Things like glucose, things like ions um, that are vital to come into and out of cells, okay? And so this is a measurement. This was a measurement we measured in the lab showing the current, the amount of ions going through the membrane over time when we had alamethacin, which is a mouthful, peptides in the membrane. And this is a peptide that feels the applied voltage and opens up. Now it doesn't open up and stay open, it just increases the chance that it'll open. And so that's why you see in the current measurement, you see spikes that are very intermittent, right? And they're somewhat random in when they occur, but if you squint your eyes just a little bit, you see that the levels they open to are not random. It's quite discreet. And the, in, the zoomed in picture on the right shows that the levels that it opens to are very discreet, okay? So what's that, what is that showing us? That's showing us that when these things open up, they open up to specific conformations, or you can think about sizes. So what we're able to see from a measurement like this is a single ion channel opening and closing very quickly, and we're able to then understand what can fit through there, what are the cues that demonstrate its, uh, that, that affect its functionality, and ion channels are one of the key targets in a lot of drugs. And so by understanding and being able to measure these types of things, then you could uh, screen your drugs and better understand their effects for, for applications. Yeah? These different levels, are they at all analogous to uh, electrons around a, an atom that can, with energy input, go to a higher level? Um, does the, those levels seem to be discrete? Yeah, so maybe you're thinking of kind of like band gaps of electron energy in, in solid state materials, in, in semiconductors. It's similar. So what we're seeing, and this peptide, as the little cartoon up there shows, this peptide likes to lay on the surface, and then when it gets enough stimulus, it'll dive through. 
But what we're seeing when the current spikes is that those transverse or those inserted peptides, they form a ring of, of peers, right? So it's like three or four people holding hands and the circle in between them is where the ions go, okay? Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing those open and clo close and the different levels are actually reflecting how many different peptides are in the ring, but it does take a different amount of energy to stabilize those different rings. So I, I think that's a pretty good analogy, actually. Yeah. yeah, so with this one, you're right. So we'd probably see, and we would call them conductance states or conductance levels for that channel. And so these provide really discrete information at the single molecule level. Um, and it's kind of an amazing type of measurement to make. So a little bit of physics so that we make your lunch worthwhile. Um, <laughs> so these are very kind of simple geometries, just two partial spheres stuck together. Um, but we know, just like in the, in the bubbles we were blowing, that there's a tension, right? It caused the strings to bend. Here, there's tensions too. There's a tension around the surface of the droplet, and there's a tension of that flat interface. And so those tensions pull the thing into whatever shape it wants to be in. And so we can take measurements of the angle, theta, and understand information about the tensions of the system, okay? And so we can change the amount of contact by using small oils or large oils, right? We can tune kind of the preferred geometry of the system. And then the, the Lippmann equation says that the angle between the droplets is a function of the charge built up on the interface, okay? So uh, more simply, the GIF shows that when we apply voltage, we slightly vary how much they're in contact. And that's because those tensions, that force balance, changes when we apply electrical stimuli, okay? So we can use this, it seems kind of in the weeds, but we can use this information and just simply take pictures of our connected droplets and back out physical information about um, the, the state of the system. And if we vary the constituents in the system, we can understand how those those parameters change, right? We could dope our membrane with cholesterol and start to see that balance shift. Or we could, we're hoping to, in the next coming months, dope them with engineered nanoparticles and understand how does that disrupt the energy and the, the properties of the membrane. So um, how am I doing on time? You got a half an hour. I got a half an hour? <laughs> I doubt that. So we've got two projects that I want to talk to you about today, and it'll just be kind of a, a cursory look at kind of how that connects to these ideas of cellular gossip and bubbles and droplets, okay? So one is the National Science Foundation project that we started just about a year ago, where we're trying to understand how engineered nanomaterials, those that scientists make in the lab, how they may affect cellular systems, whether those are plant cells, animal cells, human cells. And then the second one's a, a little more harebrained of thinking about how can we use these as basic models for synapses and neurons, and think about that as a, as a building block for new types of computing, okay? So let's go back to the, I already um, revealed my, my stat, but um, let's go back to kind of thinking about nanomaterials. If we're thinking about engineered nanomaterials that could be interacting with cells, let's put that into perspective. So this shows kind of a grading scale um, of length, and we see that it's listed in nanometers, so a water molecule is about a tenth of a nanometer, really small, whereas a tennis ball is, oh, 100 million nanometers in diameter, okay? So between that, you get the different kind of gradations of size, and what we're gonna be thinking about are nanoparticles or nanomaterials that folks are synthesizing that are typically between two nanometers and 100 nanometers. And for reference, a cell, as the cancer cell shows there, is often on the order of 10 microns, or 10,000 nanometers. Okay, so these particles that we're interested in are much, much smaller than the cells, and that could have significant consequences on what they do to the cell. Okay, and why does the size matter? Well, it turns out, and this is kind of a nice thought experiment I found in a paper, that if we think about the area of a given particle, relative to its volume, that property changes dramatically when the, when the particle gets small. So imagine we had a cube that was one centimeter on each side, right? And then we divide it, and we divide it all the different directions, 
and we get to a point where we have um, each cube only has one nanometer on each side. So we've divided it many, many times, and now we have a bunch of different cubes that are much smaller in their dimension. If we calculated the, the uh, area, the surface area of all those particles, it would be about as much as four hockey rinks. Right? So we have the same volume. We started with that amount of material, we just cut it up. But now our surface area is vastly different, vastly bigger. And so that's important because small particles, their reactivity, their interfacial effects, how they attach to things, often that scales with their surface area. So this hopefully shows you that surface area goes way up. So size does matter for these types of nanoparticles. Here's a red blood cell, again, to give you a sense of scale. Um, it's about seven microns in diameter or 7,000 nanometers. Okay, what types of nanomaterials are out there? There's a whole bunch. Um, there's some traditional ones like carbon black, and they just look like little kind of spheres. They're very common in um, strengthening rubber in making materials more conductive. Uh, they're used on the industrial scale. Uh, there's multi-wall carbon nanotubes, which is, looks like spaghetti, uh, and those are kind of a newer class of materials that people are interested in. They give great conductivity to materials, and so they can be useful for dissipating heat or conducting electrical signals. So they're very valuable. People are creating all sorts of different structures, even onion-like particles that have multi-layers, right? And, there can, and I think in the application here, um, this was an inorganic, a metal oxide-based material. It was used to improve energy efficiency of solar cells, right? So making the light conversion more efficient, right? We've actually been playing with nanomaterials of a different type. Uh, in the last couple months, I had a postdoc working on taking strands of DNA and assembling them up into structures. And so we made uh, little gear-shaped structures. I like to think of them as little chunks of licorice because they kind of look like licorice. And this is a TEM, transmission electron microscopy image of these nanostructures. And they're about 20 nanometers in diameter and 40 nanometers long. And they're really uniform. It's pretty cool that we can form, we can take DNA, which is genetic information in us, and we're not using it for genetic information. We're just assembling it into a 3D geometry. And there's some really nice techniques out there to enable that nowadays. So th those are some flavors of nanomaterials. But the crux, and really the motivation for some of our work, is the fact, and it was well phrased in this paper, is that assessing the effects or the exposure of humans or the environment to engineered nanomaterials, ENM, is very challenging. And in many cases, there are no occupational hazard levels or exposure levels defined. We don't know how much is too much or how little is too little, and it depends on the material. Um, and it's also complicated by the fact that just working with materials that are this small is tough. And so understanding their effects at the cellular level is not trivial. And so that's where we're trying to come in and help answer some questions. And this is just one slide to give you a sense of how readily um, kind of diffusible or, or uh, movable nanomaterials in the body are. This is a slide taken from, or a picture taken from a paper where they were thinking about nanoparticles that were inhaled. They go into the lungs. Then they get rapidly uh, diffused into the epithelial lining, delivered to the bloodstream, and then transported all throughout the body. And so you can imagine, depending on the type, the composition of these nanomaterials, they could wind up in any number of spots in the body. And unlike larger particles that your body can clear well, and, and concentrate and get rid of, these things are too small in many cases, and so you might accumulate them. And so we don't know enough, and that's where, uh, again, the, some of the effects are not well described to date. So what are we doing? This is just one slide on the project we're working on. We're collaborating with a, a professor at, at um, EPFL in Switzerland, and his group makes an interesting type of nanoparticle. It's a gold nanoparticle that's maybe two nanometers, five nanometers in diameter. And what they do is they coat it with amphiphilic ligands. Okay, so just amphiphilic molecules. You guys know that word now, so you immediately knew what I meant, meaning the coating could be both uh, happy around water and not like to be around water. And so that's what the different colors represent is that kind of duality of the coating la layer. And what he's shown in his group is that these are pictures of cancer cells that those particles will readily go into the cell and diffuse everywhere. Where if they made a particle that had 
less of the balance between hydrophobic and hydrophilic tendencies, the cells would take it in, but only through endosomal uptake, which is where they kind of encapsulate stuff they don't want to have in the cell. They keep it sequestered, and they can then break it down and get rid of it, right? So there's different mechanisms affecting how they're getting into the cell, and you can see in the image the fluorescent staining that they end up in different spots. What's cool is they haven't found any uh, downsides or, or any uh, toxic effects of these nanoparticles. So the inspiration is, hey, these things go in really well. Can we make better drug delivering technologies that can get the drug into the cell and deliver it where it needs to be, right? And so what that requires is maybe filling in this gap. They see the effect, but they don't know what's going on. And we've partnered with them to take our droplet interface bilayer, our little salad dressing in a test tube, and try to understand how these nanoparticles interact with the membrane. And so we're going to make measurements. We're going to try to correlate that to, to data taken on cells and, and better understand what does it take and what physical mechanisms are making this type of interaction happen. So we're looking forward to more work on this project. The last little bit um, is our work on what I'll call brain-inspired materials for computing, learning, and memory. This is really kind of a um, showcasing work that we had over an NSF project that just ended uh, this summer and a new Air Force Office of Scientific Research project with a bunch of universities that just began uh, in June. And the goal there is to um, understand how the transport and, and kind of um, variable uh, signal responses of our materials could provide new ideas for better computing. What does the Air Force want to do with that? Well, they want technologies, they want materials that can provide embedded signal processing, decision making, learning, uh, basically artificial intelligence in a material. They want that on UAVs, on other warfighter uh, instruments, so that there's more smarter stuff out there to help um, in, in complex environments. So why would we want to mimic the brain? Well, it's actually quite slow compared to the average computer. And this was a slide my colleague put together. Um, and so what he's comparing is the number of operations per second, calculations per second. And the brain can do quite a few, three to the 16th, three times 10 to the 16th. But that's maybe an order of magnitude lower than what a computer can do. So we're not as fast as a computer. But here's the kicker. We consume way less energy, right? It takes a Big Mac a day and you can do all this computation, whereas the supercomputer at Oak Ridge maybe costs $100,000 a month in just electricity costs, just to run it and to cool it, right? So the power consumption are just vastly different. So if you think about in efficiency, the brain has it beat you know, by a long mile, right? You could also think about it in terms of how much space does it take to do this calculation, right? <laughs> and, um, my head's a little large, but in, in most normal size heads, you know, it's, it's only about a liter of space that it takes to do all these calculations. And in your head, in your brain, you have about um, 100 billion neurons, and each neuron is connected to another thousand neurons, right? So they're highly interconnected, and so you have about 100 trillion synapses where information is being shuttled back and forth at, at, in many fabulous ways that we don't yet understand. But all that to say, the brain has a significant advantage in computing density or performance density. Okay? So far. So far, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, so what are we really targeting and, and what specifically enables the brain to be so, uh, so flexible, so adaptive, so powerful? It can be uh, kind of boiled down to the behavior at a single junction between neurons, right? And I just told you how many there are, and so there's a huge number of junctions that are required to make our thinking processes happen. But at a single junction, we'll call it a synapse, where two neurons come close together, they're responding to uh, action potentials and chemical cues to be able to relay signals across that little gap, okay? And so one of the key properties of synapses is that that communication, how often they send signals, how much of the signal they hear, you could think about it that way, depends on how much activity has happened in the past. So if you excite them more often, they can often grow stronger. And so they, became, they can tune or amplify their sensitivity 
to that communication pathway. So you could think about that as learning, right? So if you keep probing something, if you keep putting in a stimulation, your body can physiologically learn and adapt to that stimulus and strengthen those connections so that then that pathway is a preferred pathway of information exchange from then on, right? It can also happen in the reverse. And so some types of connections weaken with more stimulation. And so that's really important. And uh, the graph on the right is somewhat complex, but let me try to break it down. So imagine that this is the action potential, the little voltage spike that comes down the neuron. And it's happening at first pretty often. And we're seeing maybe 10 or 20 spikes in a row. And then we have a break, right? So this self-adaptability that neurons exhibit allow its strength of connection, how well it can communicate that information or respond to that information, we can see that it can actually upregulate. It can get stronger. So it, say, it sees after the first five or six pulses, hey, there's a lot of information coming in. Let's get better at listening to that, that channel and communicating that information. But in some cases, if you continue to perturb it or stimulate it, it'll weaken, right? And that's really useful. That kind of desensitization is useful. Uh, an example, so the neurons that are tied to the retinal uh, pathway of communication, they can desensitize when the light goes from dim to bright, right? So imagine if they didn't. You turn on the lights and now you're getting a lot of information coming from those retina into the brain and you're just getting overloaded with signals. And so the fact that you can respond to it but then desensitize makes you a little less sensitive to that continued perturbation. So all that to say is the brain is very adaptable, very flexible. Its activity depends on not just what's happening now, but what happened in the past. That makes sense. We have that intuitive feel. Um, and it can change in multiple types of ways. So we would, as engineers, we would say it's very nonlinear. We don't always know what it's going to do. OK, so let's do a thought experiment, and I'm almost done. So I don't know how many of you work with electronic circuits, but we're going to be thinking about these model membrane systems as electronic circuit devices. Uh, but you probably all watered your flowers at some point and pushed water through a hose. So let's imagine uh, making a graph where we plot um, on the x-axis, we plot the pressure that we apply to the water flow through the pipe. And on the y-axis, we plot how much flow, maybe gallons per minute or something like that, is going through the pipe, right? So as you increase the pressure, you get more flow. That makes sense. And if it's all positive pressure, your flow goes in maybe the positive direction out the tube. And if you start making that pressure negative, i.e. suction, you could imagine just reversing the direction of that flow, OK? So that's kind of what that graph shows, right? Well, the same holds true for electrons in resistive materials, OK? So an ohmic material um, named after the scientist Ohm um, says that the relationship between the current of or the flow of electrons through the material varies with the potential difference, not the water pressure, but the voltage that you apply on the system. Okay? Same concept. Okay? So here's where we're going to try to break from that. If we want to mimic synapses and neurons, we need something that doesn't just exhibit a linear relationship between voltage and current. We need something that allows the current to depend on not just the current value of the present value of voltage, yeah. but the history of voltage, right? That gets a little trickier, OK? So one way to do that is to have a material whose current voltage plot looks kind of like this, OK? So what we say is that this plot, this blue line, is pinched at 0 volts. They, they cross at 0. And it's hysteretic, meaning if you increase the voltage, then you follow a different path coming back as you decrease the voltage, OK? So you take somewhat of a figure eight shaped path. You don't take the same path back as you did out, right? So this hysteresis can be boiled down to a basic analogy to memory. So um, if you had applied, if your current voltage is here, maybe the current is there. But if you'd had an additional stimulus in its prior history that brought it up to this level, then you could have transitioned it to a new state. And now its, it's electrical resistance or its conductance uh, is different than what it was previously. Right? That wasn't very well said. But this sort of basic behavior is a way to mimic synapses. And the Air Force and others 
uh, are interested in understanding how this type of adaptable history dependent conduction can be used to develop autonomous hardware. You might have heard of the word machine learning in recent years. Most of that's done in software to understand how to pull patterns out of data and uh, autonomously make decisions. The goal with circuits built from these types of devices is that the circuit could do it itself, which would be more energy efficient. Okay? So here's our setup. You know it well by now. We're going to try, and what we've been looking at is trying to mimic that pinched hysteretic curve using a membrane. And our argument to the funding agencies when I wrote the proposal is the brain is not a silicon-based circuit. It's a soft, gooey mess with a lot of liquid. And that's what we work on. <laughs> so how, how can we study kind of synaptic plasticity and computing using soft materials? And what potential is there, pun intended, for having new types of signal processing? And one of the advantages of this technique is that if we're using soft materials that kind of transmit information in ionic currencies, we could maybe better interact with biological tissues in the future, right? A silicon transistor may not be able to interface directly with the body, but something that's soft and works with the same molecules maybe has a better shot. Okay, so let's do another quick set of experiments. So imagine we take our membrane that you saw there, and we just have lipids, which you now know what they are. You know what the structure of the membrane is. And if we applied a voltage to it and plotted the current, now you kind of have a sense of what that plot looks like. And we just did that. So we increased the voltage, bring it back, and do several cycles, right? And I would argue there's nothing interesting here. And you'll probably readily agree, OK? So, but, and what you don't see clearly is that hysteretic loop that maybe is a key uh, target for the activity that we want to do to mimic synapses. But nonetheless, that's kind of our baseline measurement. So our hypothesis was that if we include voltage-activated peptides, similar to the sodium and potassium channels that are in all of our neurons and that open and close when, when our neurons are firing, uh, that we may be able to get some of the same activity. And so uh, alamethacin, you've heard me say this word, it's a pore-forming antibiotic produced by a fungus, and the fungus uses it to try to break down bacterial cells. Um, but we're going to use it just as a voltage-activated model. And so we did, uh, not we, the royal we, my postdoc, did the measurements. And he did a really nice job of mapping out the current to voltage relationship across a membrane with these voltage responsive molecules. So we see a couple things. So as the voltage increases, about 100 millivolts, we start seeing a lot of current. And that's the point when those channels start diving in the membrane and forming those rings of friends, right? But on the way back, we're not following the same path. There's some hysteresis. And so it looks a little different than the idealized graph I showed you a few slides ago, but we see that pinched hysteretic behavior, which classifies the thing as a memory resistor or a memristor, which is a type of device, and makes it analogous to an adaptable synapse in the brain. And so if you peered into this paper, which came out about a year ago, you'll know that the hysteresis comes from the fact that the area changes with voltage. And that was that Lippmann equation I showed you, right? So this is like a pop quiz. Everything's coming back to where we are now, right? So the fact that the area of contact, the geometry between these droplets changes with voltage means that the system is able to kind of dynamically adapt, right? So we, in, the, in our paper, we put together a mathematical model to predict this behavior and to explain what were the factors driving this sort of response. And we've been working with some folks at Oak Ridge National Lab who do computing, and they took the properties of our model and are putting it in simulations to see, okay, if you did build a salad dressing based computer, <laughs> what could it do, right? And so they connected six or seven of these synapses together and showed that it could do some kind of classical types of machine learning applications. So you could show it images of flowers and it could classify the flowers as iris types, right? I don't know enough about how they do that, but it's basic classification theory. And these soft nonlinear devices did it better than some of the prior systems that they had used, right? Yeah? Does the, this curve hold for repeated cycles, or does it change the more you do it? That's a great question. It's actually quite stable. So these interfaces, I haven't touched on that at all. Even though they're five nanometers thick, they're liquids, they're stable for hours to days. So over the course of enough time, we can collect a ton of data. And in that time, the current voltage uh, relationship is quite stable. So we see the same thing over and over. And it's shown a little bit here 
millivolts per second that value changes, the rate at which we sweep the voltage or the frequency, that does affect the response, which makes sense because if it doesn't have enough time to react, it won't do as much than if you give it a slower path to follow. Yeah. So that was kind of our mimic of, elect of chemical synapses in the brain where they require enough of a threshold before they open up and fire. We had a follow-up paper, and I'm almost done, where we tried to mimic electrical synapses, the gap junctions like the ones in the cardiac muscle cells, those handshake molecules that link two cells together and pass information quickly. And so we just had a paper published where we mimic these not with gap junction connexons, which are the ion channels in those, but with gramicidin peptides. But similar to these connexons, which link end to end, we used a peptide that linked end to end, oops, wrong way, link end to end here to form a channel. And so we could still exhibit kind of that structure that's mimicked in the electrical synapse, but also some of the pinched hysteretic shape that you see. Now, it doesn't have that same threshold dependence, and that's because this, this uh, ion channel is not a voltage-sensitive ion channel. It's always there, and it's always open. And so um, the area, or the, the hysteresis here, again, is kind of the dynamic uh, reconfiguration of the bubble connection rather than the channels themselves. So we did one more thing, and th this is in preparation, we don't have a paper yet on it, where we took another antibiotic, and I think it's coincident that all, coincidence that these are all antibiotics. I don't think there's an untapped potential of computing using antibiotics, but, <laughs> but we're finding that molecules that act as antibiotics work well in responding to voltage in our system. So that's maybe a better way to say it. But we picked another one, it's even a, more of a mouthful, it's called monosomiasin, and it forms pores and membranes when you apply voltage. Um, and it's much slower, and so uh, we got similar types of pinched hysteretic curves, but it takes many seconds to enter and exit, and so there's some interesting dynamics there. And this is the last slide I'm going to show you that's research. So we talked a little bit about this, how synapses can upregulate and then desensitize to continued stimuli. With this monosomiasin species, we could mimic that behavior. So the plot on the right here shows the current we measured across a membrane that had these species. And with the first pulse of voltage, and the pulse trains are shown up here, you got a little bit of response. But then if we started hitting them with repeated signals, uh, shown here in the middle, then that strength of connection would get way stronger. But then eventually it would hit a peak and start to desensitize somewhat. And so we're excited because, to our knowledge, this is the first time that someone's mimicked this sort of kind of dual adaptability where it gets stronger and then it weakens over time. And honestly, I don't know what we're going to do with it yet. That would be the obvious question. But it's kind of exciting to think about us taking biological molecules, the same types of species that are in the brain, and potentially revealing some of those same complex behaviors that we probably use and we just don't fully understand yet. Yeah. So we're excited to try to model this and understand how these devices work. So, Here's my overview of my research, and I'd welcome any comments or questions afterwards, and happy to talk to people. But you kind of get the sense that we study soft interfaces, and we're interested in both biophysical questions that our model system can help us answer, and also, as engineers, we try to take some bioinspiration and think about how can we develop material systems or computing building blocks that could draw from the mechanisms that happen in biology. Uh, so, these are some of the things that we've worked on in the last couple of years. Uh, really grateful for the funding uh, for our work, uh, and most importantly for all the students and collaborators that have helped uh, us do the work over the last couple of years. So with that, I'll finally shut up. <laughs>